Hello and welcome. I am Scrapperlock and this is City of Heroes. We are with Mr. Eclipse, our level 11 dominator at 16,000 XP earned. 4,500 to go to get to level 12 and our DOs. We have 102,000 earned information and we got a million traded down to us from Liberty Lass who has like 40 million. So we have a bunch more that we can trade down but we don't really need more than a million to start with. So we just started there and you know when we get to SOs we'll worry about whether we need to get some more from her. Um, we are on a story arc called Clockface, where we're dealing with the malfunctioning and corruption of the clockworks, which are um, kind of like the town janitors and stuff here in Praetoria. And as we go, we're going to talk about game companies and video games versus tabletop games and the uh, merging, kind of, of the two. At least that's how it seems. We're going to aggro somebody here, but we'll get out of the way quickly enough. Um, so, yeah, there's a couple of videos and an article making the rounds about the announced... Uh, what would the word be? The announced packages that you can get for uh, the new version of Dungeons & Dragons. 6th edition, 5.5th edition... D&D 2024, whatever you want to call it. So they have, I guess, I haven't really looked into this at all other than the basic prices. They have on the D&D Beyond website the ability to do some pre-ordering, and I guess there are tiers of the pre-ordering somehow. Uh, and the one person was arguing that this makes it like video games, right? The kinds of video game releases. So... When you get a video game, you can buy, like, the premium edition and the gold edition and all of this stuff. And what it'll get you is, like, you get early access. You get, like, to pre... Uh, or you get, you get, like, a an early version of the game. We're getting ambushed here. Well, let's, let's just block everybody down. Way over aggroed. Fortunately, we do have that AoE. And I'm going to come back in here and relock them. If I can relax some of them at least. Um, so anyway, the uh, lots of video games have it where they'll, you know, you can. Um, here, let's lock them down again. And we'll back up. Uh, lots of video games have it where you can, um, you know, if you get the premium edition, you'll get things like, uh, you know early access to the game so you get into the game a week early before everybody else which lets you you know the way gamers want to you level up faster than everybody else oh, lots of missing yeah we way over aggroed in here um you can uh get to the content before everybody else which is what everybody wants to do and so it's uh kind of the higher tiers get you that and then um, you may get like skins, characters that you can um, play that other people can't. We're going to have to go outside and rest. I'm super over aggroed in here. Um, I can definitely see why my stalker had all kinds of trouble. All right, because you I aggroed two spawns, but then I got ambushed by another spawn. And the spawn one of the spawns was already four. Right, so like, oh, now there's like 12 people attacking me. I can't handle it as a Dominator with only one AoE. Um, so this should de-aggro them while I'm out of there, and they'll go back to the, other than the ambush, they'll go back to their normal uh, positioning. And the other problem is that I can't focus fire them down, right? I have to keep spreading out the crowd control, and I can't even do damage because I'm just doing crowd control, crowd, crowd control, crowd control, crowd control, crowd control, and I can't stop because if I do, they'll kill me. And I can't do any, any damage to them. So i got to be a little more careful with going in there and aggroing. And one of the things that my Plant Thorn Dominator had, because she came out during live, uh, is she had uh, Teleport Other at this level, not Self-Teleport. And you can do a pull. Right? So either that was an ambush or maybe it's a patrol, because it looks like this guy is patrolling. Okay, well, I didn't need to do that to him, I guess. Um, so, yeah, they were talking about how uh, you'll get different skins, you'll get different 
like an extra mount or it's that nobody else gets so there's like the pre-order there's the gold edition there's the platinum edition the premium edition the uh bonus edition whatever when you have these video games and i guess they're doing something similar with dungeons and dragons in the sense that they are um they're letting you buy into different pre-order tiers i guess and there, there were three it looked like there were three tiers on the list that i saw that included like increasing numbers of digital dice um one of the tiers you got like a digital dragon miniature that you could use on the one D D site when it launches and that sort of thing and you get like so there's like the digital only bundle where you just get the digital books i think there's the book only bundle and then there's the both and those are the different tiers oh and you also get like early access to the game book for by like a week or two and the guy was saying like what is this early access to a role-playing game it's bizarre and um to not not just a not a computer role-playing game obviously a, a tabletop and he said this is like the most bizarre thing i've ever seen and it's really being done like uh modern video games which you know, I don't like the way they do those either. So he was just talking about how they're treating like a video game and then pointed out that, you know, a couple of years ago, the CEO of um, I don't know, either Hasbro or Wizards or whatever said that that's what they wanted to do with it, right? They want to make it like a video game with microtransactions and pre-orders and all of this stuff because the video game companies make a lot more money, I guess, than... D and D does so they want to they want to monetize, and we know that um, the current the former CEO of Wizards of the Coast, right, Cynthia Williams, um, said that she thought D and D was under monetized. I thought there were more guys here, but I guess not. Um, which means they want to monetize it more. So you know she left, but her plan to monetize it doesn't seem to have changed at all and so i guess one question i have for you guys is what do you think of it right like what do you think of the idea of having video game having a video game like monetization scheme for a tabletop game and i thought about some of the other tabletop games and it's like you know when it comes to things like kickstarters and stuff it's not necessarily the case that a lot of other companies are all that different. If you look at, um, say, the way Pinnacle does it, right? Now, they're giving you paper things, but when you do their Kickstarter, there are a bunch of tiers, and you can get bonus content, right? You can get, like, a GM screen. You can get miniatures, like the, the, the cardboard miniatures, the cutouts, what they call the standees. You can get um, the... Uh, uh, dice, bennies, archetype cards, additional archetypes, um, pre-made characters, uh, collectible action decks, and all of those things are, you know, kind of similar. Now, at least with Pinnacle, you're actually getting a physical thing. It's not just digital. But I'm not sure conceptually all the, that it's all that different. And I think one of the lessons that companies seem to have learned from game gamers, like video gamers, is that um, video gamers actually like all of this extra kind of content stuff. And they're willing to pay for it, especially if it's some sort of an exclusive collectible thing that only they're going to get. Right? Now, again, in paper, it makes a lot more sense because on paper... You know, you've got an actual physical object. There is a limited number of, of them. You're you're going to be the only one who has it in a few years, or you know, only the you know, there's only 5,000 copies made. So if you're into the collecting stuff, you could maybe see it. <clears throat> Whereas digitally, there's an unlimited number of copies, right? It's only limited by how many they feel like giving out. They're not actually crafting anything, and they'll sell the. Um, the package to whoever wants it. Um, there are games, I've seen them, where they have like 
after they're out for six months or whatever, they have some sort of a deluxe edition that you can buy where you get all of the like pre-order goodies in one package and it's extra money. You know, the game costs $75 instead of 50 or whatever, but you can get all that stuff because there aren't a limited number of them, right? They, they didn't print them. They just digitize them, right? So they can, right? There isn't a limited number of dark, dark dominators that you can get in City of Heroes, right? You can, any number of people can do it. Um, so it's, it's really weird to think of the digital stuff as collectible. And yet, games have been doing this for a long time. And um, so is the controversy really that Dungeons & Dragons is doing it, or that what they're doing is so reminiscent of what video games do and there is this charge that... I hear it glowing. Where is it? What's glowing? Where the heck is it? Oh, here it is. Um, I guess the complaint is that it's... It's becoming more like a video game. And, and in fact, that was the charge that was leveled against them when some of this stuff started getting announced... You're turning D&D &D into a computer game. And no, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. And now the um, purchasing tiers and all of that seem very reminiscent of a video game. Right? And the idea that you're getting like 15 digital dice skins and that sort of thing um, makes it seem a lot like a video game. Right? Because the dice are only going to be usable... Presumably in D&D Beyond and or 1 D&D, right? They're not going to be... You, you're not going to be able to use them anywhere else. Right? And I, I think part of the goal here is then to give you a, a reason to keep coming back to their site, right? Once you're invested in the, um, the purchase of the digital dice and you've bought all these digital dice, right? Then are you going to want to switch to Roll20 and play there without your digital dice? Or Foundry? They're not going to work in Foundry. They're not going to work in Roll20. You're not going to be able to import your 3D digital figure of a dragon or whatever it is um, into Foundry or into um, Fantasy Grounds, presumably, right? So Because they don't do things in 3D. You're not going to be able to import it into Tailspire, which does do things in 3D. So, you know, it... I think part of the goal is to tie you to their system, right? So that when... Once you're, like, once you're invested, right? The sunk cost fallacy, once you're invested in the one D and D system, then you're gonna to wanna to stay with it so that you can um, so that you can continue using the thing you spent the money on, right? Otherwise it's kind of a waste. Wow, this guy I didn't even see this guy. Where did he come from? And I am missing so much, and that's what's killing me. It's not the it's not really the over aggro, it's the missing. Right? Because I can't lock them down and then they just run up to me and shoot at me. So yeah, there I think part of what's going on is the sunk cost fallacy of once you've bought enough into the D&D Beyond slash 1D&D ecosystem, switching ecosystems is going to lose you money essentially because you can't use what you got at 1D&D with anywhere else. Now we're going to do some dominating. 
See, I missed again. Can't tell who's the controlled one. Okay, I think I've got all of them. The controlled one is still acting. See, missed again. It's amazing how the just one level, plus one, makes you go from hitting most of the time to missing like half the time. Let's do that. There we go. Let them fight each other while I shoot them. And now hold. Don't need those two. One thing about yellows is they do get you a lot of XP. So yeah, leave your comments. What do you think of this whole thing? Is it really different from Pinnacle Games offering a box set of um, the new edition of the, the revised edition or updated whatever, Savage Worlds, the 20th anniversary edition? of Savage Worlds Adventure Edition where they're going to um, you know provide me with a you know, like gold foil embossed cover of the new book and um, they're gonna give me bennies in the box and a collectible action deck and uh, collectible dice and you know like when they did the um, the new Asian themed one which was uh, Legend of Ghost Mountain. They actually put a figure in it. It was a really cool, like, Chinese dragon. It was so awesome. It was a very pretty figure. And, it, I, like, I almost wanted to get the box set because I wanted the figure. It was the only way to get the figure, right? But um, but I didn't because I wasn't sure I was interested in, in the, the actual setting. Um, but, yeah, I mean... Is that really different? I mean, the main difference is that it's physical rather than digital. But it's still the same idea of that you um, you are paying extra for this limited edition thing. And, like, I don't know how different that is. I know a lot of people are upset about it. And... Um, but I think part of the problem, a, again, is that it's not just electronic, but it's locked to the D&D Beyond website, right? It's not, I don't think it's free PDFs, right? It's uh, because Wizards doesn't do PDFs as far as I know. It's, um, D&D Beyond text access, right? And so, um, like in Savage Worlds, they have a digital deluxe bundle, but it gives you everything as a PDF, right? And you get it immediately as soon as it's ready. There's no, like, early access or anything. If it's ready, you just get it. Once it's ready, you just get it. And oftentimes, they'll let you download the beta version because they want people to test it and stuff, right? And if you get the physical, you get the free PDFs. And then, usually, you get the PDFs immediately, and then they just say, well, we'll ship you the um the physical when it's ready so like i have the night train box set which is a re uh, like a, a deadlands the weird west redo of an old deadlands pre deadlands reloaded like classic deadlands module and um that box set come came with a whole bunch of stuff all the stuff i already have it right i already got it immediately as a pdf Right or not immediately, but I got it. Like I went in on the Kickstarter, and then like some months later, they said, "Okay, the PDFs are ready." It's going to take us a while to print the physical copies, right? It's got to go to the printer. It's got to get shipped and all the rest, and they update you as they go. But the uh, the PDFs were available are already available, and I've already read them, or, or I could have read them. Uh, let's. 
get that guy over aggroed here. I was wondering if I might get a little too close. I think we'll be okay. If I don't keep missing. Because we've confused a couple of them. Let's confuse another one. And then this guy is going to become aggro to me, but that's okay. We'll take him out and let these two guys shoot each other. And we can dominate, so let's get that guy. Let them all attack each other. Wow. Let's see if we can hold that guy. They're under domination, so they should hold each other. They should fight each other for a little while. So yeah, I don't know. It's definitely created a a stir, and it's one of these things where I'm like, well. I don't know why anyone's surprised and dismayed, because they kind of told us they wanted to do this. And when people said to them, they're said to, uh, when we said to the others out there, like the, the fanboys and fangirls out there, this is what they're going to do, we were told, you're out of your minds, they're never going to do that. Missed him twice. Unbelievable. Um... So, yeah, we were told we're crazy, they're not going to do this, you're, you know, what was it, you're, um, uh, Chicken Little, right, sky is falling, false alarm, and now we find out, yeah, that's what they're doing, of course it's what they're doing, that's how they're, they're going to make millions doing this, why wouldn't they? I have to say when all this stuff happens, I, you know, on the one hand, I say I feel like I'm well out of it. On the other hand, I'm not well out of it because I think eventually my group is going to want to go back to D&D &D and s some way or other I'm going to have to deal with wizards and its nonsense. And that's the mission. There's another glowy here. and Oh, yep. Yeah. yeah, once the mission, this is interesting, once the mission completes, these guys are not attackable. Interesting. <clears throat> Let's talk to our buddy here. Okay, you got the parts. Great. And now we're going to... Um, he sent the sch schematics over to his friend at Omnitech to take a look. Uh, they were discussing on a scare chat when the channel went offline, so yeah, she's probably in trouble, so we got to go and rescue her now. So let's set the mission. And off we go. I think one of the things I like about Pinnacle is most of the books, if you want to cheap out, you can spend 10 or fifteen dollars and get the full PDF and by the way it's shareable you're they ask you not to but all they do is put a sticky note and say please don't share it because then we won't make any money on it and I always say to anybody like the people playing with me and stuff look it's ten bucks for the suede PDF I think you can afford ten bucks right and if you if you can't afford it you know you're welcome to play with us and I will share the rules within Foundry, but I'm not going to give you a copy of the PDF. Right? Now, with Deadlands, I did. Right? I told them, don't buy it. I will share just what you need. Because what I don't like about Deadlands is it's got all kinds of spoiler crap in there. And anybody can just read that. And, you know, it's not that I don't trust my players, but, you know, just realistically, you're bored one day, you have nothing to do, you're, you know, waiting for your airline flight, and you, the reading material, it's delayed, and you read all your reading material, and all you got left is the Deadlands book. You start going in and reading stuff about hucksters that you're not supposed to know because you're not playing a huckster. So that stuff I all kept inside Foundry and said, I will unlock it for you when appropriate. So the guy playing the huckster is the only one who really knows the details of hucksters, right? And 
uh, the person playing Harrowed, or the person whose character died in it is possibly come back Harrowed, is the only one who knows the rules about the Harrowed. And the person who's playing the weird scientist is the only one who knows the rules for weird science, right? And the person playing the ranger and the person playing the weird scientist who's also a um, an agency member, those guys get to know a little bit more about the Reckoning because their agencies would tell them, right? Because their job is to fight the Reckoning, and so their agency warns them about some of this stuff. So I gave them, you know, here's a couple paragraphs. But... I specifically avoided, tried to avoid giving the rest of them any real knowledge of the setting that you would get in. There's so many references to things in the books that you're really not supposed to know as a player, but but they have them in there anyway. And um, then they reference a page you're really not supposed to be reading, which is really frustrating. It's one of the things I don't like about um, the Deadlands setting book. And, you know, I've said this before, Pinnacle Games used to do um, separate setting books for players and GMs. And um, with Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, they stopped doing that, and they started putting out just one book for everybody. And I know why they do it, right? It's the same reason why Wizards of the Coast puts player-facing material in GM-only books like Wild Beyond the Witch Lake, which is a source book for GMs, or Strixhaven, which is a campaign book, right? Those are supposed to be for the GM, but they put um, player character classes and races and stuff in there, and they purposely do that because under the auspices of the D&D Beyond website, you have to now, you, they, you can't buy the books piecemeal. They knew they were going to do this, right? You have to buy the books... Uh, wholesale like you have to buy the whole book in order to get the content and that's because they know that you know if, if there are a million D&D players and only you know maybe 50,000 100,000 GMs they'll only sell 100,000 copies of the book maybe not right if, if they'll say there's 100,000 GMs but they're not all going to want to run the Wild Beyond the Witch Light right they might be in the middle of doing Curse of Strahd right now and they're not going to be running that and by the time they're ready to run a new campaign a different different book has come out and they decide to do that instead, so they don't buy it, right? So they're only going to maybe sell twenty-five or 30,000 copies to the GMs, making up my numbers, right, out of the 100,000 GMs. And the rest have to go to the players, and there's like 90% of their market that will only buy player-facing content. And my guess is Pinnacle's done the same calculation, and they're a small company, I understand, right? The, the player-facing, you know, the, the Deadlands Player's Guide is only 10, 12 bucks, and the GM's Guide is 20 they're losing a lot of money on um, the player. The player's not buying that GM-facing material, and so um, yeah, I, I understand why they have to do that. And but as a GM, I find it very frustrating that the um, that the book is for everybody. But then there's huge chapters of it where it says, hold on there, partner, you should only read this if your GM gets permission, or hold on there, partner, don't read this. It's only GM material. But you referenced some of the pages that say that in the pages that are fully player-facing at the front of the book, right? So that kind of frustrates me, and I felt like in order to protect my players from the spoilers, I had to, you know unlock all of that reference content that was for them but you know with GM permission I had to rev unlock that under with the right permissions in Foundry right rather than saying to them go buy the Deadlands book I was saying don't buy it read what I have unlocked for you because it avoids the spoilers and it pained me to say that because I want to give Pinnacle money right I want Pinnacle to earn money because they're a great company but you know, they they created a source book that's actually very problematic for me as a GM. And there's just no two ways around that. And I would think any GM running Wild Beyond the Witchlight would have to say the same thing, right? If you're going to buy it, only you know, now you have all these chapters about the monsters and stuff. It's not that players are going to cheat, but, you know, I bought this whole book. Don't I get to read it? If I'm only going to be able to read, and that's why I said to them, don't buy Deadlands, right? Because if you look at Deadlands, the Weird West, I've got it sitting right here. Um, 
the no man's land, right? Players, avert your eyes unless the marshal told you to crack open this chapter. It's chapter 6. Mystery is crucial to the Weird West. No man's land is where we hide all the secrets, right? So unless you're playing a huckster or a shaman or a ranger or one of those, an agent, you're not supposed to read that. So somebody who's playing a gunslinger or something, right? It This starts on page 51. The book is 196 pages. So you're going to spend, cover price is $39.99, $40, and you only get 50 pages to read. And all the rest of it you're not supposed to read. That means three quarters of my money, 30 out of that 40 bucks is wasted. So it doesn't necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me if a player said, you know, I paid for this, I'm going to go ahead and read it. I mean, I understand. You said to spent the same 40 bucks everybody else did, but I get to read all 196 pages and you only get to read 50. Right? And that seems a little unfair, no? I definitely think so. We have domination up, that's good. Let's hold him. There we go. That's what I like to see. We got domination up for this guy, so let's confuse him. And that should keep him confused. So, um, you know, again, in the old days, what they would have done was taken that 50 pages, and that would have been the um, the player's book, and it would have cost, like, 15 bucks or something. And then the $40 GM reference would have been just for GMs. Instead, they expect everybody to buy it. And that's why I said to my players, don't. Because I don't necessarily want um, them to be tempted to look at what else is in the book. Right? And also feel like they, you know, have possibly been, you know, gypped by paying all this money for a book they can only use 50 out of 200 pages of. So fortunately, the uh, Deadlands uh, ambush. Fortunately, the Deadlands um, material in Foundry does allow you to share it. In fact, by default, the whole thing gets shared with the players, and you have to go in and turn that off. Um, so I went in and turned off the content sharing for everything that was listed under No Man's Land and so forth, and then I just turned it on for the individual players. Whose character for whose characters it was appropriate. So, um, it's um, it's frustrating to me. I would much rather have separate player books, right? But unfortunately, they don't do it that way. Oh my gosh, we have another boss? Okay, I'm probably going to die. I don't have any way to... Yep, we're going to die here. Let's try to flee. Instead of fighting it, let's just get out of here. I don't think they can hurt her, so we might be able to pull her out. And if they kill me, then at least we got her out. Is she coming? Okay. We got out. We escaped. Yeah. Discretion is the better part of Valor there, especially as a Dominator with no inspirations left. Okay. So we got that mission. We have another mission. But before we do that, we're going to go and um, talk to our contact and get some... Uh, Inspirations. I definitely feel like this character lives and dies by the inspirations far more than somebody like a Scrapper or a Brute. And of course that's, I guess, to be expected since he is a Dominator and he's kind of squishy. What, is he not here? You've got to be kidding me. <sighs> okay guys, let me pause while I find inspiration somewhere else and I'll bring you back. All right, we are back. Um, you gotta love it. None of my contacts will sell me. Well, the, my old contacts won't talk to me. My, none of my con current contacts are selling inspirations. I had to go back to the supergroup base 
and I bought them there, and I probably could have gone to a hospital. I didn't think of that until I was in the supergroup base, but... That is so weird. Like, why they don't just allow you to go to the store with your old contacts, I don't know. Anyway, we're back, and now... So the reason is, while we were saving Susan, the guy, our contact got kidnapped, so that's why he wasn't there to sell me inspirations. But I definitely cannot do this stuff without inspirations when they're going to be ambushing me like this. Right, I remember somebody saying, which of course I didn't realize the first time I played in here, uh, that these missions were tuned to be harder because so many players are complaining that it, the base game was too easy. And so, um, they, de they definitely are. It would be interesting to see how you know, like a scrapper, or how I could do with a scrapper or a brute in these missions, because I haven't done them, right? I did them with a stalker, but the stalker at this level is really dependent on stealth and assassination, and ambushes ignore stealth, right? And one of my supergroup mates said, oh yeah, they partly threw that in there because they felt like stalkers were playing the game on easy mode, and they wanted to, like, force them to have it be as hard for them as everybody else, the problem is it's not as hard for them as everybody else because Hyde is their signature power, right? So a stalker being forced to play the game without Hyde, it would be like me being forced to play the game without any control powers and only use my attack powers. Or without domination. Right, which then I need against bosses, because otherwise my holds do not last long enough enough against them. Right, a scrapper could do it if you take their crits away. They're still fine, and I know that because for months they didn't have crits. That was put in later. Right, a tanker could do it without gauntlet. They just get to and provoke. And they only need that on a group anyway. But you take Assassin Strike, you take Hide away from the Stalker, that's a major problem, especially at low level because it's one of their secondaries, right? So instead of a defensive power, they have Hide. Right? And at 10th level, when you only have, like, one secondary, maybe two, right? We have two secondaries here and four primaries, and one of the primaries is Assassin Strike. And the other, and the one of the two secondaries you have is hide, and you kind of take those two away. You're really taking a lot away from a stalker. So I know they were trying to like even things out and make it so that stalkers couldn't just stalk to the end of missions and, you know, assassinate the boss and walk away, right? Because then you, it's not just that, right? It's that you don't have to use any inspirations, so you can load up on the exact right inspirations that you need. Right, and then you can give, um, you can load up on the exact right inspirations that you need, and then you can trigger those right for the boss fight, do all of your assassination stuff, and then use it well, under the auspices of the inspirations, run out. And I guess, you know, the problem was that stalkers were able to do kind of risk free rescue missions and stuff. Right, so they said, okay, well, the ambushes are going to know where you are, and they're going to be immune to hide. I'm not sure that was the right way to handle it. Right, a, a better way, although possibly equally frustrating, but more realistic, would be, well, okay, if you're under hide, when the ambush comes along, they're, gonna, they're not going to see you, so they're going to attack the guy you're trying to protect. Right, and now that forces the the stalker to be tactical about it, right? Okay, maybe I'm going to turn hide off on purpose so that they don't kill the guy I'm trying to protect. And yeah, I'm sure that would be frustrating, but at least it would be realistic as opposed to they know exactly where you are, whether you're trying to protect somebody or not, even though you're hidden. Hmm, okay, we gotta go up. At first I did not realize that was an elevator.
I do love domination, I will tell you that. It's interesting how much playing how much playing this character sort of semi reminds me of the the book the lit RPG book I'm almost finished with now uh, he who fights with monsters because that character has some shadow powers and does a lot of like debuffing and crowd control um, I don't want to say any more because it's kind of spoilers but the main character kind of can do that and um, so when I'm doing some of my shadow stuff. It kind of reminds me a little of that. Look at all the misses! Let's take a look at those hit rolls. We rolled an 86 against a 72 to hit, 97 against a 72, and 94. So in one, two, these four rolls, it was 86 and higher, three of the four, and then 120. Yeah, I know. It's possible, but my gosh. So I do want to um, make an update because the, uh, whoever it was was telling the story about the GM throwing the three dice and they all rolled up 20s. So that GM had a whole bunch of different dice, like 20 different dice, and um, yeah, it just was lucky. It wasn't, it wasn't that those three dice were necessarily bad dice. It, it's always hard to know, right? Because um, as, I, as I said in the comment there, um, the, uh, there are companies that unfortunately are kind of known for, um, for badly molded dice. And um, if you buy dice from that company and don't realize it, you're not going to get just get one badly molded die. You're going to get a bunch of them. And if their manufacturing flaw, as I said in the last episode, is the same like for all their 20-sided dice, then you could get a bunch of 20-sided dice that tend to roll high or low. Um. Wow. Wow. All the missing. Just so much. Look at again. Oh. So this character, look at another miss. This character's main problem is the missing. So we definitely want to put multiple accuracies once we get to level 12. Look, a miss again. Like we're almost missing 50% of the time. That's insane. And there's no excuse in here for badly molded dice, right? That's a bad RNG. Uh, I've been saying they have trouble with their RNG for years, so we won't we won't recanvas that. But um, yeah, so apparently that GM had lots of dice, and you know it was just GM luck. GM GMs always get lucky. Uh, one of the actually one of the players of the one of the uh, viewers of the wildcard show um, s actually did some stats and um, wrote out the. Actually, Jordan Caves Callerman did not actually have a higher chance, that that much of a higher chance of rolling well and acing and stuff as the other players. He just said, Jordan rolls more, more often, right? The GM rolls a lot more. So yeah, they're going to ace more because they roll more, right? If I roll a D6 75 times in an evening, I'm going to get like a dozen or so aces. You're only going to maybe roll that D6 15 times in an evening, so you're going to ace a couple of times. Um, so that's also true, right? The GM rolls a lot more frequently. I got the wrong guy. I am doing a terrible job of tab targeting these guys, too. That's part of the problem. I'm not used to doing that either at range. I'm not used to tab targeting that much at range because usually I'm melee with them and I just, you know, whoever gets targeted, I just beat them up. But with this guy, I have to be actually careful as to who I'm targeting because I'm supposed to be, like, confusing one, holding one, 
and then immobilizing and attacking the other. And if I hit the target, tap target the wrong way, end up targeting and shooting the wrong guy. Our domination is now over. So it refreshes in about two minutes after it goes down. I wonder if hasten would affect that. It probably doesn't. If anybody knows, not that I'm planning to get hasten with this character, but if anybody knows whether hasten would affect how fast the domination comes back, let me know in the comments. So I'm going around here cleaning up because I keep getting ambushed. And one of the problems I've had is that when I get ambushed, if I haven't cleaned the room out, right, I can end up blundering into another spawn that I didn't clean, right? And so now if I try to, like, kite guys around this room and um, in the middle of an ambush and I blunder into this spawn, now I'm fighting a spawn of plus ones, which at this level I can barely take. Now, back to domination, whether it can um, be hastened. It probably doesn't matter, right? Because you got to fill this bar. And so you're probably not going to fill the bar in faster than two minutes anyway, just at the speed with which the bar fills. You might in a group mission, right? If you're throwing out a lot of AoEs and you don't have to run around to get targets. But in a solo mission, you probably wouldn't because... It takes time to run around the base and find your next set of targets. Another elevator up to the third floor. I wonder if these things have the five floor limit that all the other bases and maps do. They probably do. This is really cool in here. All right, it's the same. So this is the office map, right? Reskinned. It's the same little square going around, but instead of um, the office stuff, you get this. It's really cool. And it just, even though it's the same, like, assets in terms of the 3D structures, how the hallways are constructed and everything, it, it looks completely different just by reskinning stuff, which is really cool. So anyway, I do want to make very clear, I was not trying to imply that I thought that that GM was deliberately cheating or using purposely rigged dice. But um, but I did think that perhaps just the fact that he was rolling so many 20s and then he rolled three of them and they all turned up 20, might have just had a bad batch of plastic dice that tended to keep rolling a certain way. But obviously the person making the post would know that better than I do, right? Because they played with that GM. So I, and I was just speculating and I definitely would feel weird about it if I were the GM and I got three nat 20s in a row. But, I mean, it does happen. Right? It's just very unusual and it's very statistically unlikely when you're actually attempting to prove that your dice, that you are not cheating and you throw three dice out and they all come up 20s. We do have domination up. That's good. So we'll, we'll go after the boss. But I've learned my lesson from this... Uh, this set of missions in Praetoria that I have to sweep the whole room because it's very, very likely that wa that after fighting the boss or while fighting the boss we will be ambushed. Right? So one of the weird things, let me try this when I... Okay, let's go over here. Right, okay, so... Let's go over. Let's go over here. This is clearly the closest, second closest, third closest. Control tab is supposed to do the closest. And then it's supposed to tab away from you. But I feel like a couple times I've done control tab 
and it's it's gone over to this like another spawn over here right it's not just because i'm looking at it but like i'm over here looking at these guys there's another guy off over here control tab is put it going over there i don't know if i'm just rotating the camera in a weird way because i'm playing a dominator instead of a scrapper or something and i'm not in melee or what So one of the things we want to keep them immobilized, one of the reasons we want to keep them immobilized is that though they can shoot at me, um, the immobilization prevents them from closing in and using that um, uh, fire flamethrower or whatever it is, the, the fire cone, which is uh, PBA, PBAOE, point blank, area of effect. Definitely need to get some AoE damage going. It's amazing how much easier it is to hit the white cons. And it really is only like a, what, 7% difference into hit by level, right? It's only minus, I think, minus 7.5%. So, of course, there I go, two misses in a row. Just as I'm talking about it, what are the odds? Okay. So is that the whole room? Is that everybody? It looks like it. Let's just double check because I've been smacked around before. Okay, so the other thing I'm going to do is the doorway is over there on the other side of the room. So I'm going over here because a couple times I've been facing away from the door and gotten caught from behind. All right, so we're going to do break free, double lux, accuracy, dominate, control. Whoops. Control. And then hold. We got him. So now we have to just keep holding him every chance we get. Domination should stay keep that up, and we should be okay. Let's refresh the control. And we got him. It's much easier when you have domination up. I almost want to keep this guy around for the ambush that is probably coming. But he won't follow us. There's the ambush. And it's another boss. Got him. Let's make sure we hit. I don't know how many more bosses there are going to be. The problem will come when we um, lose our domination. Because that's holding him right now. But domination is going to go away in about 15 seconds. Maybe less. We've got this boss. But if another one comes here, yeah, there goes the domination. We won't have it. So let's flee as fast as we can. Come on, buddy. I'm not going to hit the sprint because he can't run that fast anyway. They're super slow. And they get lost, as you know. Okay. Straight across. So this is why... Sweeping rooms is important. Uh, let's see, we go this way. Yeah, we get out this way. Uh, 
Oh, we are so close to 12th level. Beat in half. Is that a bad guy? I don't see anybody. So I don't know, maybe that was supposed to be an ambush and it didn't register somehow? So I don't see the point of leading this guy all the way out when there were no ambushes. So I wonder if, was there a bug? Were there supposed to be more ambushes? You know, like this? Was that supposed to be another ambush? I don't know. We have one bead left to go to get to level 12, guys. One bead. Probably one more mission. But we're already 55 minutes in. So I don't think we're going to do that. Um, we have this continuing story arc. We will, I guess, get to level 12 at the beginning of next episode. Because um, we're going to stop here. It's been almost an hour. Until next time, guys, I'm Scrapperlock, and this has been City of Heroes.